This is Nachum Winkler. Uh, I met Rabbi Kimmel about a year ago, and uh, my wife had gone to him. And I have to tell you, this can go to the internet, this can go to any place in this universe. Anybody with anything should just spend time with this Rabbi, Rabbi Kimmel, Rabbi Yitzchak Kimmel, because he really is. Rabbi Yitzhak Ben Sara. He is a Ben Sara. He is light. He is joy. He is chizuk. He is pure, unadulterated love, kedusha, and tara. He gives every last ounce of his energy to people. Each one he sees is his most important person. When I walk into him, my heart jumps. I light up. When I lead, no matter what was on my heart, whether it was about me or a patient or any of my children, I know I have someone whose tikkunim work. I know for a fact they work. I know someone who is helping me in my avodas Hashem. I know someone who I have the privilege of learning with and davening with at 5.30 in the morning on a Friday morning, and then after that we have a, I have a full day of work. It's hard, but when he walks in, it's just like uh, I'm breathing pure oxygen. Just to be around him, just to watch him in davening. He doesn't have to move, he just has to give you that smile. I feel like he hops you right away. Like what comes out of his mouth is clearly Ruach HaKodesh. He has a gift he works very hard at it. He develops it. He is the most sensitive, and it's so wonderful. In my life, I've been privileged to grow up with great Tamil Chachomim, Kedole Hadar, and the family, and I've seen many Mikubalim. It is wonderful to talk English to a Mikubal and to help him understand the nuances of different issues. And he always does. And I just, I can't say enough about uh, Rabbi Kimmel. You know, there are a lot of people out there with abilities, or kochos, or whatever you call them, uh, but they're not such good people. So when I first met Rabbi Kimmel, uh, I could tell you the, it, which sh he shined above all the others. You know, I just want to point out that because of Rabbi Kimmel, things that I knew were important, that everybody knows are important, but never really took seriously because we don't understand the depth and their effect on our neshamas and on our mazel and uh, overall things like basic things like uh, Tehillim, Davni with a minion, Mishnayis, a very big thing for Rebbe Kimmel, uh, things like that, you know, I've become more acutely aware of how important they are and uh, my life as such has improved in ways which I can't even describe. Uh, now I go to him once a month. Right. Um, I, I just make a point to come visit, um, just check in with him, you know, I'll come if there's something urgent pops up, I will come also, but I generally schedule just a monthly uh, checkup, a check in with him. The, absolutely, there there have been times where I walk in and he knows, ex it, like he shows me that he knows exactly what's going on. There's no way, we don't have the same friends, we don't have the same, we don't move in the same circles. There's no way that he knows things about what's going on in my life, what's going on in my innermost thoughts. Um, he doesn't, there, I don't, I wouldn't even have told my best friend certain things and he knows them. He knows things about, say, a grandparent that nobody here knows, nobody knew. They've been long gone from this world and, you know, he's able to pinpoint with accuracy certain things. I mean, some people would call that heebie-jeebie or some people get very scared by that. I would say to those people, not to get scared by this because the, the rabbi, he's, he's not threatening in any way. Um, yes, he will know these things, but he also has the sensitivity to know that if you're going to get freaked out, he's probably not going to, you know, show off and say this stuff. You know, he doesn't need to show these things. Um, what he's really here for and what I've found over the years, uh, 
he is the world's best coach at strengthening an individual's relationship with Hashem. Well, when I first went to Rabbi Kimmel, I was scared to death because here I was very uneducated in the world of Judaism. I expected to see somebody that was going to be with a long white beard and a coat and a temple and I didn't know what to say or what to do. And I wind up going to, to where's it, Flatbush? Flatbush. Brooklyn, <laughs> to Avenue, no, 29th Street, to a walk-up six-story thing. And I walk into his office and I think I'm in the wrong place. And everybody was warm, Avram and Elke, they were wonderful. And then I, had, I went into Rabbi Kimmel and he shook my hand and... Uh, Brief tears to my eyes. I'm sorry. It's oh, very okay. painful. Uh, when I met him, he looked at me, and he knew I was very troubled. And he said, I see what you're going through. And he said, I think I can help you. And he talked to me, and he talked in a way that nobody ever spoke to me before. And from that point on, he said, he gave me tefillin, which I never used since I was 13, because I thought I'd choke myself with it, because I forgot how to use it. He gave me a talis, he gave me the two prayer books, and he said, I think you're ready for this. He showed me day one how to use it to fill in, how to use it, what to do with the talis, what prayers to say. And from that point on, I've been seeing him regularly for two years, and I can't tell you how he's changed my life. And I just, I can't say enough about uh, Rabbi Kimmel. Uh, since I've met him, I have begun to learn to daven again. And my davening has changed, thank God. And I, I really know that the looking forward to Shabbos through him has become uh, a wonderful, wonderful avoda. And he, he just knows how to be uh, a father, a brother, a mother too. And uh, this is Rabbi Yitzchok Kimmel. The yeah. story goes like this. I have first-hand knowledge of all of this. Um, the get story is this girl gets married and uh, it's not what, you know, it was a quick thing, it was a pressured thing, she was getting older and she married somebody um, without going to see Rabbi Kimmel first. And, you know, that is that's um, that is what it is. So come to find out, three rabbis within a few weeks, three rabbis tell her you really need to get this, it wasn't, it wasn't okay, like she just couldn't stay in there. Um, the guy goes and disappears. So then, you know, this is an impossible case. He's disappeared. You know, he's... Uh, what's going to happen? So, um, I know that, you know, I, Rabbi Kimmel comes in and she talks to Rabbi Kimmel. Rabbi Kimmel, without ever having met this man, he sees the name and he started to imitate the man who disappeared who's not giving a get. He imitated him, he started saying things that the guy used to say. It was a little freaky. Um, yet he kind of, I don't know how he did it, he zoned in on what this man's mentality was at the time. He was able to look at, I don't know how he, he was able to do it, but he was able to see the different players in the story and he guided this girl say this to this person, do this to this person, and then come back and talk to me. And then once he got that information, okay, now do this and this and say this and this. And somehow or another, the Bays didn't involved in this really had given up hope. Um, well, they didn't think this guy was going to give no, them the divorce. No, yeah. this, this Rav had been doing Gittin for 40 years. And to this day, he will talk, if somebody that is familiar with the case, you know, I know the, there's another rabbi that, that I know who uh, every time this, this Av Beis Din sees this rabbi, tells him he gets goosebumps when he thinks about this case and how everybody was so shocked when the man finally was brought through the door and it really is 100%, I, 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 I know the case it, without Rabbi Kimmel's advice and without his being able to hone in and see whatever it was he was seeing and without the advice, there's no way Seichel alone would have gotten that get. Crazy things have, have happened. I mean, uh, crazy good things. The, the first time, you know, I needed, uh, you know, it was a financial thing. I was taking a financial hit on something. Uh, 
whenever I won't get into specifics, but uh, you know, there was a time that I was working on something and I was taking a financial hit because uh, it's a product that you have to sell. And uh, I came to a kid once and said, Rabbi, I met all this money. I need some type of uh, idea. Give me an Aitza. This is going to be okay. Just say this to him. You know, don't, don't worry about it. You'll be okay. How long should I do it for? Three weeks, four weeks. Not a week into it. Not a week into it. It completely turns around. Not only did I not have to run after, you know, to try to sell this product. Someone came to me and says, oh, I heard you're working on the product. Let me take it. You know, it's just something so interesting that you don't really expect certain things to happen. And that was just like the tip of the iceberg. Just, um, just the tip of the iceberg. This is I walked in. I was a little bit skeptical. They told me about that he can, uh, he reads into your, into your, uh, Existence for less, less lack of better word. Uh, I was a little bit skeptical, so I asked him to go in first. Right. Uh, all I did is I wrote down my uh, my name and my mother's name, and uh, I was called in. I was uh, seated right next to the rabbi, and uh, I think before I even sat down, he told me that he wants to see my feeling. <laughs> so I, I responded that my fill, my fill-in was checked uh, just about before the Yom Tev, last Yom Tev, and by a sofer, and it was, and was good. And he says to me, uh, I didn't say it's not good. He said, I see something that might be a problem in a tagim. He said, and, uh, and he asked me to bring him in, and he told his helper, his uh, assistant, uh, that when I bring the feeling in, he wants to personally look at them before he goes to the sofer. Right. And sure enough, I did. I brought my feeling in, and sure enough, in the tagim, there was two two tagims that were facing the wrong way. They were leaning the wrong way. Uh, he also showed it to me because the Xerox did, and they showed me where it was leaning the wrong way. And after that, we got into a conversation. Uh, and the next question he asked me, he says, how come you're not praying in a minion? <laughs> right. And at this point, I almost fell off my seat. <laughs> uh, I just looked at him and I didn't know how to respond. Uh, but I, I started telling him that there was a reason why I stopped going for praying in a minion. Uh, it was for a while that I was praying alone at home. Uh, and he, he told me that I have special powers in my prayers and I have to pray them in a minion. I have to pray in a minion. And he says to me, but, and he held up his finger. He said, but this time when you go to pray in a minion, he says, no arguments. And the reason I stopped going to this minion, because there was constantly arguments about their politics, and leftists, and righties, and, and, and I got tired of that. And he, and he zeroed in right on it, and I was just like, did somebody tell him about me? I mean, I was wondering what's going on. I mean, and he says to me, this time when you come in, he says, you say good morning, you go in, and you pray in your own speed. They pray fast, you pray in your own speed. They pray slow, you pray in your own speed. You finish, you pack up your stuff, you say goodbye, you leave. No politics talking. Again, he, 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 he zeroed in right on, on what was happening. I was, I was stunned. I mean, I was just, I, I couldn't speak at that point because I was like, almost like my life is a sick rule. Right. And then he goes to me and he says, who introduced you to your mate? And at this point I was just like, how do you know I have a mate? How do you know that I'm not married? How do you know anything? How do you know? And, and, and I proceeded to answer. I said, well, a friend introduced me. And this is what really happened. A friend stopped me in the middle of the street, asked me, asked me if I want to meet somebody special. And this is what, and he goes like this, he says, no, he says, your parents arranged it. Your friend was just a shaliach. I was floored. Because how does, first of all, how do you know my friends are up there? Right. How do you know my parents are not there? I mean, like, you know, it just totally threw me to a loop. Uh, we talked about business, he was on a point about what I feel inside, about how things should be running and what is it I'm leaning to and so on. I was just totally taken, totally, totally taken. And then he, just before the end, he's like looking at me and says to me, and why aren't you getting married? So I remember I looked at him with a smile and I just said, chicken. <laughs> and he smiled and he says to me, 
you're getting married. He said, you can keep being chicken. He said, you're getting married. You don't even know it yet. Uh, he actually was the reason that motivated me and my wife to get married. Uh, we were both in a, in, a, in a relationship for over 10 years. We were very comfortable in that. And his energies, his push, his, his, his whatever made us think about it. And we decided, well, this is what we're going to do. We got married. Uh, Baruch Hashem, we're living a very good life together. We have a very good uh, uh, relationship. Uh, we're happy. We're forever grateful for him. I mean, he became like... It was a very good step up for you to yes. get married. Can I tell you a really weird story? Yes. This is a funny story. Okay. Please. So, I used to... I, I, I wash and I go hasser after using the restroom. And, and I, I, you know, I, well, I'm careful about that. So, I used to work in Manhattan in an office building. And I had my washing cup in the, the the office building. The whole floor shared like a ladies' room and a men, whatever. So in the ladies' room on my floor, uh, I had a washing cup under the sink, and I just used to pull it out and use it. People on my floor knew, you know, this is what I did. So <clears throat> there was one one time I came in to see Rabbi Kimmel, and it, it so happens that he didn't know this, and who who cares? I never even mentioned it to people. The, the bathrooms on my floor in my building were being renovated, so I had to go up or down two flights of stairs because they were doing two floors or three floors at a time. I had to use the 11th floor, okay, the bathroom there. And the, I didn't know the people, and the bathroom was wide open. It wasn't set up the way my, my floor's bathroom was set up. So I felt kind of funny about bringing a big plastic washing cup with me every time I went to the bathroom. So I just, you know, I had learned that you can turn the water off and on and that's sort of, halakhically it's permissible and you can you can do that. That's so, the second choice. That's yeah. the second choice. So that's what I had been doing for like, I don't know, I'd say it was about three weeks. And I came in to see Rabbi Kimmel and, you know, I came in, hello, hello, how, how are you, you know, whatever. And he, he looks at me and he goes like this, he goes, What's with you in Nagel Foster? You used to be so good about this. What are you doing now? What's going, what's going into you? So I said, what are you talking about? Of course I wash. He goes, and I said, oh, the bathroom floor is on my building. So I explained to him I was using a different floor's bathroom and that I was doing turning off the sink off and on, off and on. And he said, that's it, because he saw that my hands were different. He said, I see it on your hands. My hands are no different. I'm sure it's all baruchni, and I don't understand these things. And he did say halakhically, whatever, you know, what your rav told you, you could do this. It's one thing. But al pisod, you really should try to bring a cup with you. That's funny. <laughs> so he saw on my hands. And so I asked him, I said, people that don't do this, because he sees it on them. Like, he can tell. I, I don't know how he does this. Well, that's something. There's no way for anyone to tell that. That's a yeah. that's a perfect example. Yeah, because but it was, it's it was impossible a really cute story. It. And of course, he didn't make me feel bad. He's just like, I know you. What is what's gotten into you? You know, it's very funny. A specific story that I heard um, from someone who told me that his wife was I think eight months pregnant, and she was in a lot of pain, a lot of pain. So they went to the hospital. She spent a lot of time in the hospital over this particular pregnancy, and. Um, he calls, he calls up Rabbi Kimmel one day, the husband, and says, Rabbi, I'm in the hospital with my wife. She's in crazy pain. I need a bracha, what should I do? He says, well, calm down, and whatever you do, just make sure that the doctor gives you a sonogram. Just make sure the doctors give you an emergency sonogram. Well, okay, Rabbi, I, I, I can't make them crazy, I'm in the hospital. You know, you can't just ask the doctor for a sonogram. They come when they come, and whatever. He says, whatever you do, just make sure they get a sonogram. Say this to him, make the sonogram, everything will be okay, just Dhamma Tashem. Just make sure they get the sonogram. And he, you know, very reluctantly went crazy in the hospital and made the doctors come and do a sonogram. And as uh, this mother, this expecting mother, is sort of in like preterm labor, she's in massive pain. And they do a sonogram and they realize that as she's in labor and she's sort of pushing without really pushing, the umbilical cord is wrapped around the baby's neck. And on the spot, they did like an emergency C-section, and the baby turned out to be fine. But, you know, if the rabbi didn't A, calm down the father, and give the father an eight some, 
And so listen, just tell them to do this. You know, no one wants a screaming father running around the hospital. I'm scared, you know, you know, come, uh, you know, give a sonogram. A sonogram is a very simple thing to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, as far as I'm concerned, but Kimmel saved that baby's life, which is, you know, just one life, right? Yeah, he knew that there had something had to be looked at, Some, obviously. Something, he had to know something that I, no one else knew. Um, I'll tell you, like, I got married recently. And, you know, I had been waiting a long time, and there are a lot of single girls out there that give up hope or get bitter, just, and, and it's so understandable. And I really, at one point, had just said, you know, okay, so this is my fate, and, you know, I'll keep trying my stylist, Rabbi Kimmel, he's, he, um, I, without him kind of guiding me, I, I don't know if I would have ever gotten married. Well, that's a fantastic. I really, yeah. I, I would tell you from the fact that he he knew who my husband was after I, I brought his name to him. He realized he knew him. He said, "No, you really should marry him." But uh, you know, um, I, I would have married him anyway, maybe. But it would have taken a lot longer. And you know, um, he was able to take the two of us and kind of cut to the chase. And in a very rational manner, too. Like, it wasn't all heebie-jeebie stuff. We were like, okay, you know what? We'll just get married now. It's good. And it's, it's honestly, I couldn't have asked for better. You know, someone once uh, contacted me. They have uh, a mind. You know, I don't know if people read the newsletters, but, you know, I, I could attest to this story personally. And someone said, hey, listen, uh, Kimmo seems to, you know, know what he's talking about, right? I'm a little arrogant about it. And, you know, let's let's test him. Let's see, you can test Rabbi Kimmel. He's, you know, he, he's he's Rabbi Kimmel. You don't test the rabbi. He says, well, let's see. Oh, okay, you know. So I come sitting right here in this chair, and I went to the rabbi, and I said, listen, here's the situation. These people own all this land, and you know, they seem to have, you know, lots of gold. <laughs> Um, where should they look? We're talking about 40,000 acres of land. It's, you know... Oh, where, where is the gold? Where, where is the gold? Yeah. You know? And I'm sitting right here, and I still have the papers, and he just starts circling and circling and circling different parts of this, you know, rugged map. And uh, at the one spot, he circles and X's and circles and X's. He says, this, this is the place. This is where they are now. But this is the place that they're going to see a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of, of mazen. So I run right back to my office, which was a block away at the time, and I fax this map to this person in the West Coast, and he calls me up. Two seconds later, he says, Shlemy, how does he know? How, does he, how did he know? We are there, and we're seeing a tremendous, tremendous mazel. I said, no, 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 but that's not even where he said the big stuff is. So they went a few months later to do, um, you know, testing, to do like jewel testing. And they found more concentrated uh, gold and silver there than in any other places that they tested. And they just can't get there physically. It's just hard, you know. It's a very hard business, the mining business. But that's, that's how do you know? How do you know? He, what, he made it up? You know, this is physical, you know, it's something physical. It's not that someone's coming to you and saying, Oh, uh, tomorrow you're going to tie your right shoe before your left shoe when you should tie your left shoe before your right shoe. This is not like a guess. It's not an educated guess. This is 40,000 acres. Throw a dart in the middle of 40,000 acres, and this is where it is. And that's, I mean, that's a little... That's pretty good. Uh, I, I would say so. <laughs> now, that's something that can't be a natural thing. I mean, uh, it, I can't I, tell you what gold is, is. This is not in our country. This is not, you know... He's never seen the map before. He doesn't know these people uh, from beforehand. You know, I just came as a shliach to, you know, just ask, you know, and, and and he knew. How did he know? It's a coincidence. There are no coincidences in in, in, in Yiddishkeit. In Judaism, there's no coincidences. There are people that are connected to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and they're here to help us connect to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and that's their job. And uh, and every person that walks in here, I, I believe walks out of here with that. In, in, when I was dating, he was able to just, I didn't even have to, you know, one, here's an example. One fellow I, I went on some dates with, didn't want to give me his mother's name, 
because he knew I was going to, you know, ask Rabbi Kimmel after X many dates. So I came into Rabbi Kimmel, and he starts laughing. He goes, yeah, he doesn't want to give you, you know, he, he knew. I said, yeah, he goes, he goes, I don't need his mother's name to see him. It, you know, I don't even need his name. And he started describing to me physically what the fellow looked like and what his personality was and even some funny, like, he, like little repetitive jokes or sayings that the guy would make. He imitated the guy in front of me. And then he said, not only that, I can tell you his mother looks like this. And she's got it, at, you know, he described his mother's attitude. Right. He described his mother's appearance and her, even down to her smile. She had a very pretty smile with a lot of teeth. And he even described that. He even told me his mother has arthritis in her neck. Now, come on. He didn't even know the guy. He didn't even know his name. Never saw him even. Yeah, that's so, funny. So, I... I Go, go figure. These are the things, like, for me, I take it for granted. I don't need to be convinced. Did, did he seem to know things about you that were impossible to know otherwise? Yes. He took that piece of paper with my name and my wife's name and my mother's name, and he holds it up, and I don't know what he sees on that paper, but it amazes me how he closes his eyes and he starts telling you things about what you're going through and, and who you are as a person and things you need to do, and... He, he even tells me things. I had an a new employee here that he knew nothing about. And I went there, and in the middle of the conversation, he says to me, how's your new employee? And I go, what new employee? He says, the new employee that just started working for you. She's a young girl, and she works in the back, and she's very quiet. And I don't even remember. And I said, yes, I just did hire someone. How'd you know that? And he said to me, I'll tell you something else. She's going to be leaving you the end of August to go to school. And I said, no. She said, that's not true. She said, she's going to be with me all year long. The end of August comes. She comes up to me. She says, Dr. Valens, I have to leave. I'm going to school. So, I mean, these are things that he does that, that blows you out of the water. And, uh, and every person that walks in here, I, I believe, walks out of here with that. You've seen it? You've seen people walk in and out? I mean, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm sure if anyone is you know, watching this that has been in the office and you sit outside in the waiting room and you sometimes you, know, you see newbies, you see people who are, have never been to Rabbi Kimmel before, they have, no, they have no idea what to expect. And they walk out, and they're just like, they're like pale. Like, what just happened? Not that Robert Kimball is like a scary person in any stretch of the imagination. He's actually one of the most friendly people you could possibly be. But it's just, ha, ha, what just happened? How did he just know that? And, and it's just, you know, I remember the, the first time that that happened to me. That, you know, that mindset hit me like, wh wh what just happened there? And it was just, it's just awe-inspiring to continue to see it every time you come. And it's, it's... Every time, every single time you come, you see someone new, not one person, you see a dozen people a day that, that, that come. It's really incredible, different types of people that are coming from, you know, all different walks of life that are coming for a little hadracha, a little bracha. Um, you know, people that need the bracha or need some type, or just people that just want to work on the Yiddish guy, and just they want a little bit more of a connection, a deeper understanding of themselves and what their ticket in life can be, and and their and their tachlis in this world, and they all come from a couple. He knew where I came from, what I was struggling with, what I needed to do for Avodas Hashem, what I needed to do uh, for my own growth, what I needed to work on what I needed to correct, and where I've been. Without you saying, without not you telling Not one word, you. not one word. And your wife felt the same way, no, obviously. A hundred percent. I have sent many people to Rabbi Kimmel. No one has ever been disappointed. Uh, the only disappointment is they can't spend enough time with him. It's a Ruach HaKodesh. It's not, there's nothing normal about it. It's, uh, but he's a very balanced person. He, he's not an extremist. He just has a gift that Kodesh Baruch Hu gave him because of who he is and he works very hard to keep this gift, to be pure and to be holy. It doesn't uh, come just like this. It can comes, it's his, but he works very hard at it to maintain it. It's very hard for him. He sees a lot of people and his heart hurts for everybody, but his tikkunim really work. Um. The point is that, um, of course, you should leave no stone unturned, and uh, one such stone is 
is uh, these roughly stupid things that uh, you really don't have any knowledge of or no no uh, no power to to change or uh, or at least to get answers until you go to somebody like Rabbi Kimmel. Sometimes he looks in my eyes and he goes in my body. And I'm trying to say, get out of there, but he's actually in me. <laughs> and it really freaks me out. Uh, but the energy and power in the room where he is, is a presence in there that is, you can't describe. You know, there is definitely something or someone in that room that is really, you can't put a finger on it. But you just know that he's connected. And don't get me wrong, I'm a man of science and I still have doubts at times. But every time I go there, he just takes those doubts and they go washing away. Well, could he, could he fake this in any way? Nah. Is there any trick that he could do? No, nah, there's no way he can fake it. But he's never off with who you are and who you need to be and where you need to go. So the real important things, he's right on the money all the time. He's a very caring, loving, regular guy. He's like one of the guys, you know, one of the guys you can just meet in a bar and have a conversation with. I mean, that's, that's who he is. He just puts you at ease all the time. But yet, yeah, you don't feel spooky that he knows all these things? No, no more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, Rabbi Kimmel is uh, in, a, in a place that people wouldn't expect him to be, physically. He's in New York, he's in America. Like, I don't know how many people expect to find like, such a holy Jew is sitting out. You know, in Brooklyn, you know, you expect someone to be like, you know, tucked away in Sfas or some somewhere in Eretz Yisrael, uh, you know, but he's here, and and he's here for a reason. Well, what my talents are, he read right into that, uh, and again, it's like almost like he's looking at you. Your life is exposed. Your life is exposed. He can reach into every little corner in your life that you didn't feel anybody noticed that, and he immediately focused right on it. Well, you know, mo uh, mo like you, before you went in, you were very, very skeptical. Yes, right. So if you would, and yet, once you walked in, within a minute or two, he was telling you, you didn't even say a word. I didn't even say, I, other than saying hello, I didn't even open my mouth, <laughs> and right away, one after another, I mean, I got, I got facts in my face. I mean, facts that, how do you know? I've never been in this area, never met you, never seen anybody in this place, in our office. Nobody knows me. Right. What would you actually tell someone if someone t if you told someone about Rabbi Kimmel and the guy would say to you, "I can't. It's not true. Nobody could do that." What would you say? I tell everybody about Rabbi Kimmel. <laughs> I tell everybody about him. It's, it's just like everywhere I go, and this this comes up. I mean, right away, Rabbi Kimmel is my story. Right. Rabbi Kimmel is my story. Uh, first of all, he has changed my life. He really has changed my life. Uh, because of him, I went to a more, more moved out feeling. Because of him, I did a lot of things. Because of him, I got married. Because of him, I'm happy in my marriage. I mean, because of him, he did a lot, a lot of changes in my life. As soon as my wife mentioned that she can go to see Rabbi Kimmel, I'm in. I'm going with you. I know you went to Eretz Yisrael even with Rabbi Kimmel. That's right? correct. Yeah. Did you ever uh, go with him to Rabbi Alfasi? And we went once, we know, uh, Rabbi Afasi, I knew, I knew Rabbi Afasi before I knew Rabbi Kimmel. Ah, right. And I went to Rabbi Afasi, and I asked Rabbi Afasi, Should, can I go to Rabbi Kimmel, since I used to go to Rabbi Afasi. Right. And Rabbi Afasi says, I should go to him, and I'll be, I, I, I will be able to continue all my good things that I need to get done. So Rabbi Afasi endorsed Rabbi, Rabbi Kimmel. Rabbi Afasi endorsed Rabbi Kimmel. He knew him well. You think Rabbi Fassi knew Rabbi Kimmel? If he well? knew, if if Rabbi Fassi knew, if Rabbi Fassi would not tell me to do anything without knowing a hundred percent, I spoke to Rabbi Fassi every single month on the month. So Rabbi Fassi told you straight out. Rabbi, Rabbi Fassi told me to go straight out, and he told me to do it, and I would I wouldn't question it. When we went for the we went there to Israel, the Rebbitzin Rabbi Fassi gave him his tefillin, and he put it on his head, and it was perfect. So you actually were there, I was there when, it, when, when they gave him the tefillin uh, from Rabbi Fassi. So you were there when Rabbanit Al Fassi herself correct. gave the tefillin to Rabbi Kimmel. That's correct. So there was a relationship between Rabbanit Al Fassi and Rabbi Kimmel also. Yes. Any of the children also with the yeah, Rabbi the children were very close to Rabbi Fassi. They spoke to him, they, uh, they confided in him, and uh, they took him on like a family member. They took, they took Rabbi they Kimmel, Kimmel on. Kimmel like a family member. I think it was the second trip in Eretz Yisrael, Rabbi Yitzchak called his Rebbe at that time, Rabbi, Rabbi Fassi, Fassi. Yeah. and he said to me, Shmuley, we got to go, we're in Yushalayim. First thing is we got to Yushalayim, we finished davening with belt. He says, I'm gonna go, I want to go visit my Rebbe. 
So we called him up, we tracked down his number, he told us where he was living. And I don't know how well you knew Rabbi Fassi. I didn't know him very well. Pretty well, fairly well. But I knew that at that time he was sick. He was very sick. It was already, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the year he was nifter. I think it was two years before. Right. I believe so. He had some issue with the kidneys, I think. He, I think he had cancer. I mean, cancer he was, he was very shrach. He was very shrach. <clears throat> and it's funny, though, because when Yitzchak called him, we weren't sure where he... We knew he lived in Yerushalayim, and remote. I think it was one of the remotes. But I remember coming down the road to his house. I remember we were driving down the street and he was standing by the door waiting for us. I mean, the Rebbe says, okay, we're in the neighborhood, I'm coming. This is a person that had no strength. I mean, his, his koyach was, was limited. He was right. sick. And at that time, he was sick. And he was standing at the door waiting to greet Rebbe And to me, it was an awe. I mean, you know, you know someone's coming, like, Mesh, I kept you downstairs waiting for five minutes, right? Right. It's normal. The guy, you're busy at the door. It's also weird for a, t- a Rebbe to be by the door waiting to greet a Talmud. So right. to me, my personal impression was tremendous. So we walked Rabbi Yitzchak to the door, and Rabbi Yitzchak went in. We didn't go in, me and Dovi, we stayed outside. And it was like the craziest thing, because, I mean, we were tired, we were exhausted. Our whole trips are usually, you know, high, high intensity, not too much sleep. But this was the, fir- the beginning leg of the trip. Right. And I remember I fell into like a crazy daze in the car and just fell asleep. I don't know how long it was, if it was a half hour or whatever. We just, me and my brother, just both fell asleep. And then after, Rabbi Yitzchak came out to bring us in, to get a bracha. So, you know, Rabbi Fassi sits us back down at the table, and, you know, he sat me and he sat Dovi on the other side. Rabbi Yitzchak was there. And he said, um, he said to me, he, so he says, oh, so you married? I says, yeah, Baruch Hashem, you have kids, yeah. He poured me some of his arak from that he still has from Baba Sali. From Baba Sali, that he right, doesn't yeah. take it out for anybody. Right. So he poured us some of his arak, and he you know, he said, I think that he said that this is from the. And he gave, and, you know, he made, we made a shahako, and, and he gave us a very simple, easygoing prophet. Like nothing. Like he wasn't reading in us. Wasn't. And I like. It's not like we were there. Like I went. Like like some people come to Rebbe. I, I'm used to seeing what people do to him. Like they're challenging him. They're expecting him to tell him what they ate for, for, for breakfast three weeks ago. Right. You know, it was simple. Oh, are you married? Do you have children? How's it going on? So, okay. And then I, so after we were leaving, I turned to him, I says, can you ever give me a bracha? Because it was very nonchalant. He wasn't yet going into, oh, you're going to be, you it was very soft-spoken and easy. So I remember with his two hands, he turned to Rabbi Yitzchak, and he goes like this, and he goes, we have the bracha. As if he pointed to Rabbi and said, that's your bracha. And then he finished the sun and we left. And I, I remember like also like when we were sitting at his table, it's like sometimes you know, like when you get too close to Rebbe by Tikunim, your head starts spinning. Right, right. That was the feeling in the room. Well you're getting it doubled. <laughs> yeah, no, it was but I and and that was one of the first times. That was like my second trip to Eretz show with Rebbe. And Baruch Hashem from then on, I, my 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 relationship built and built and it's the foundation was so strong for me. That's why it's like hard for me to give out stories like where sometimes like you'll ask somebody else. For me, it's all one. It's, it's life. It's not anymore, it's not, it's not anymore like question, answer, or, or feelings. It's well, part you're, of... You're moving up. It's, because... part, it's part of... Like, I remember, like, to, to me also, one of the things that drew me, Amistic, was the subtleness that he tries to improve people. Never in crazy, drastic ways. Where, you know, oh, Rebbe, you ask him for a bracha. Maybe you should try learning for 15 minutes a day. You know, 15 minutes a day. So I remember, that, you know, it wasn't, in the beginning, it was a lot easier to get in. So between my first visit and maybe my second visit, because I was dealing with somebody in the family at that time. Right. That we, you know, that I was constantly, I was, I was nudging him, I know that. So he asked me, so how's the learning going? So I said, yeah, yeah, Baruch Hashem. So he said, but you missed three days this week. Right, that's right. You know, right. so th- that was like direct key, like, yeah, I know exactly what's going on. They would describe things about him. I never saw my father and mother, and they would describe things about them, or say things about them that he would never know because he never saw them. Right. And he was right about them. But he was 100% right, yes. as if he did know them. Right. See, because this is something that uh, almost everyone tells, says, you know, that he just, it's he normal sees. to expect to see that the... Uh, that he knows everything, right? Right, that, that is an amazing thing. I mean, that's not something... Have you ever seen anyone else in his range that good that could do that? So, 
I believe one Rebbe. I'm a chef and I Rebbe. I... Okay, hi, my name is Israel Ruft. 2008, December, uh, was a very, very tough time. Actually, end of November, I was working for a company and uh, I was in a very bad situation. I knew that I was going to get laid off. My boss was really, uh, he was very, very bad to me, more than anybody else, and I just didn't know how to deal with it. So my friend, who also went to Rav Yitzchak, was pushing me to go see him, and I kept on pushing it off and off and off, but finally, I was compelled to go see him because I was at my wit's end. I knew I was going to lose my job. So I walked in, and I was a little bit nervous in the beginning because I figured maybe I've done this Avera, that Avera, I'll walk in, he'll see right through me, he'll tell me that I'm, uh, I'm a terrible person. So I just said, you know what, let me go and let me see what happens. The opposite was the truth. I walked in, he made me feel calm right away, even before he even started saying anything. I felt as if I had this huge burden lifted off my shoulders. He told me that it would be a rough ride, but that I would make it and I'd get out of it. And he told me to do certain tikkunim, and I started doing it. And as he said, it was a rough ride, but when it did happen, I wasn't as broken as I thought I would be. I was hurt, but it wasn't as bad. You were prepared for it. Prepared, prepared for it. it. But, again, it was very, very difficult. But Baruch Hashem, within three months, I found something else. And it was miraculous, the whole story, because I was given a very, very good severance package that lasted me to the day. As soon as I started my other job, that severance package stopped, and it, there was no gap in income at all, So, which was, which was amazing. Okay, so I went to this other job. And again, I was experiencing problems. And of course, I went back to Rabbi Kimmel, and I spoke to him about it, and it was quite uncanny. He was able to zero in exactly what the problem was. Was he like he saw what was going on on the job? Yeah, and it was like, wow. And I was like, and I knew what the problem was, but I wasn't, for some reason, you know, you know it in the back of your mind, but he was able to crystallize the problem. And the worst part of it all, all throughout this situation, the previous situation, I was blaming myself. I said, maybe I should have said this, I should have said that. You know how does people second-guess themselves? And he said, that's absolutely not the case over here. This is a part of your ticket, and this is a part of your roadmap that you have to follow. Okay, fine, I did whatever I had to do, and I found another job after that job. And then it tanked. After two weeks, the man, man just laid me off, cold-heartedly, Arab Shabbos. Two, ten minutes before Shabbos, I got an email but this time around, when I got laid off, I was angry, I was hurt, I did shed a tear here and there, but it was not the same type of feeling of, of distress. So I didn't even call Rick Himmel yet. I didn't say anything to him. I just said, we're going to get through this. That next week, Hashem was, 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 was watching me. It was, it was unbelievable. Every single day I was on an interview. Huh. Four interviews that week. The following Sunday, I interviewed with the last job that I was at. I was hired that following Monday. So Baruch Hashem, all I was out of work was for a week, and I was able to find a job that paid me much better than that previous job. So I'm working at this current job now, and of course, I'm having hiccups again. And I, and I realized that this is, a, this is a test. Hashem is testing me, and it's all a part of the way things go in life. And I went to see Rabbi Kimmel again to touch base with him, and of course the office was wonderful, they're always following up, they're chasing me, I'm never chasing them, they always make me feel like feel good that they're caring about me. So I walked in and I told Robert Kimmel what's going on, and he told me that this place that I'm working at is a very, very good place, and I'm going to stay there, I'm going to be Matzliach. And I was. The second I left, and I started doing what he told me to do, to work on my Amuna, which is something I've always had issues with, but I was working on it, Hashem was able, was made me into a different person, and... At work, I was perceived differently, and the whole atmosphere at work was totally different to the point where, like, wow, I couldn't believe the amount of Hatzlacha I was having, and Baruch Hashem Bliner that I continued to have. So, all I could say is, is that Rabbi Kimmel never, ne ne never gave me anything to do that was outlandish, anything, you know, out of the ordinary, out of the box, crazy, you know, stand on one leg and jump around and roll in snow, nothing like that. Right. Plain, simple basic stuff that everybody knows. Like Tfilla. Like tfilla. He checked my Tfillin. There were problems with my Tfillin. There were problems with my uh, mezuzah. There was a problem with my uh, Amuna vis-a-vis -vis not learning enough Svarim on Amuna. So he told me to do the Garden of Amuna, which is, which is fantastic. He told me to focus on Pirkei Ovis. He told me what to buy. He gave me health advice. He told me how to relax how to deal with certain, um, you know, uh, issues that uh, were, were plaguing me, you know, just like certain fears that he was able to help me pinpoint and how to get around them. So it, it, it has been an unbelievable experience. And I, I can't tell you enough that for yourself, 
It is, it is the best investment of your time to just go and meet Rabbi Kimmel. It will allow you to come in contact with yourself and, and find yourself. Because ultimately I think that if people don't find themselves, that's where the root of all suffering comes from. There's doubt because they don't know what's going on in themselves. And you need help to be able to find that in yourself. And I, and I am privileged to continue to have this wonderful relationship and I hope to have many, many more years of this relationship. That's very good. Um, one thing you mentioned right at the beginning, how afraid you were to go in because he was going to see everything very right. that you did. Because right, he always hear these stories. He walked into such and such. And he said, Russia, leave. He's doing his Averis. You know, because in my mind, that was, that was the way I was always preconditioned and pre-programmed. And it was absolutely not the case. It was so the opposite. I was like amazed. And he so, says, oh, that's who it is. He says, your, your father and brother are here and they both went through heart attacks. He said, so he, what he said was, I see that they went through the same thing you're going through, and they're coming to give you chizuk that everything will be okay. So that really took me to another level. And at that point he said, uh, I see uh, you're also very, f now this I had said to nobody, uh, not even to my sister, he said, I see you're very afraid that when you close your eyes, you're not going to wake up. And that was my big thing about the heart surgery, because they put you out on an anesthesia, and with my overweight and just feeling like everybody in my family died of heart attacks, that I just wouldn't come out of it. So he goes, he says, I well, see... Well, the other thing as a surgery as a kid, where you didn't wake up. Right, and the anesthesia, it was just very frightening to me. So he said... I see, and he, and he pauses for a minute and he goes, uh, when you wake up, you'll have three people over you. I see that you will not only be walking, but you will be running. And uh, he said, at first, the first few days will be difficult, and then you're going to go through 40 days that it's going to be difficult, and then everything's going to be fine. And exactly that happened. I, when I woke up, uh, I looked up and there were three people over me. Um, I did have a rough recovery. Uh, very rough. A very, <laughs> the uh, first time they, they said the fluid hadn't totally gone out of my um, chest area and because the heart was pumping extra hard. They had to re to a surgery and drain me. And then, to make things worse, uh, I got an infection, which is very bad news in a heart situation. And they had to put me in isolation. And uh, at first, it was not good. And then they gave me a super antibiotic, and everything started working. And um, finally, fast forward, when I finished, I, I looked at the time and I, I started counting the days. And when I realized my departure date, it was exactly 40 days. Wow. And suddenly I said to my sister, I said, I can't believe this. Everything Rabbi Kimmel said exactly happened. Give you an example how you travel the road or Right. He gave me a mind, not that he wants to advertise it. Right. I told him that I get pulled over a lot, I get tickets, I couldn't take it anymore. Right. He wrote, I was Friday in his house, I think you were there. I think so, yes. He took a piece of paper, he wrote up a command, he says, Rafi, put it in your glove compartment, and that's it, just leave it there. And I could say, I had a Suburban then. As long as I drove that Suburban, I did not get a ticket. I got pulled over a couple of times. Right. And weird things happen. The cop tells me, okay, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, where is he going? Right. I gotta go now. And he left. And I had like a couple of machine stories. The cop would say like, I was doing like this, I was doing, I was doing one time I was pulled over doing 90 in a 50 zone. It was late at night, the cop pulls me over. He says, okay, I'm gonna give you a brake light ticket out of nowhere. I didn't ask him, I didn't plead with him. He said, okay, I did something wrong, give me a ticket. I was like, yeah, I did it. Right. I didn't know what it is, and you should know when I stopped, I gave up the suburban, and somebody else was driving it for a while. I didn't have like a mind. And I was getting like that week or so, whatever, a month, I was getting a couple of tickets, and I asked the driver, what's going on? Like, 
Right. I'm not like I had Thomas or something, I just wanted to know what's doing. And he says, where's that command that I gave you? So I said, I left it in the suburban, I don't drive it anymore. So you just put it in your pocket right now. Which I actually have it here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I carry it around with you. He gave you another one. The no, no, the he same. He told me the same one. It's right here. His handwriting. Uh, I'll take it out for you. He doesn't let me open it up. I can just show you what it says on both sides. I know what's in it because he told me what he wrote, but I can't tell you. <laughs> okay. So I don't know, he did not tell me what he wrote, so. Okay. And it was the worst. But if you would know what he wrote, then you would be really flipped out. <laughs> you would be really. It's an amazing thing what he wrote. And, and, and that it works, it's an it amazing works. thing. Like, you know, it's not something that he wants to advertise. <laughs> right. Go against the law, Mike and I'll help you, you know what? It's, it's a protection. There's nothing right. It's, it's, not, it's a shame. He, he never told you to go against the law. No. But he told you it's a protection. It's a protection. He knows I'm on the road all day. When you're on the road all day, automatically you do. Yeah, because you need to. Part of the job is to get things fun, right. done. You're driving a truck. You're driving Anything a truck. like that. It's with things like I had a crazy accident a couple of weeks ago. Brachos, nothing happened. I felt Bashar's man's Bashar's accident. I felt like he's right there and pulled me out of the accident because the guy under me saw me. I walked out of the truck. Nothing happened. The truck was totaled completely. Ooh. I walked out of the truck. I said, "Comes to the toilet." That also comes from him. Right. Everything comes to the toilet. Everything is good. There's a reason why everything happens. I mean, I go on my whole life style. The way I changed, I became a calm person. I used to be a better person. I used to, I used to lose my temper like Michigan. Right. The common everything I said, I give him the credit. Well, he's working with you. That's well, he's working with me a lot. He puts on a lot of coffees, 100%. I give him the credit, I give him the credit for that, I give him the credit for my wife. My sister was very ill. She'd been ill for a long time, and I'd been you know, giving the Rebbe her name for a number of times, and he said that he's done certain tikkunim for her, and, and I believe that his her life was extended because of some of these tikkunim. Um, I had come to meet with him uh, a Thursday before, and I gave her name, and he, 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 was, he got up, he was pacing back and forth, and he, he told me three days. She was in the hospital at the time. So he said three days. I said, okay, three days. I, my figuring was that she'd be out of the hospital in three days. She was on a respirator. Um, sorry, it's a little difficult. It's okay. She, and he told me, he said, this was all predetermined long before she was born. Okay, I figured, okay, you know, there's these serum that she's going through. She, 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 had a, she was on dialysis. She had a heart condition. She had a hearing condition. She had, unfortunately, a lot of different... Issues. Anyway, on the other side, my wife was sitting shiva for her mother, and my sister had to go in for a surgery. They did a uh, colonoscopy, and they, they found a tear, and they had to do a surgery to repair it. I called the Rebbe for a bracha for the surgery, and he told me, he said, the, the tear was there before the test. And he goes, the surgery will go well, and the tear was there before the test. Okay, fine. I, I called my brother-in-law. I, I felt a lot of manuha with that. I called my brother-in-law. I gave him that piece of information. I wasn't too shocked by what the Rebbe told me because I've seen him say things like this before. Uh, my brother-in-law was overjoyed with the news and also a little confused because he comes from a very Litvish uh, background. Um, Not conditioned to believe that right, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, but after the, he called me back after the surgery and he said, listen, I have to tell you, the surgeon came out and he told me two things. He said the surgery went well. He said the tear was there before the test. There's the two things that he told me. Kachava, that's exactly what happened. Okay? Now, the story doesn't end there. My sister was nifted that Sunday. Okay? Such is the way things go. Um, in helping my brother to make arrangements for the Leviah, um, he gets a phone call. He doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know, understand what the guy's saying. He gives me the phone. It turns out it's the medical examiner. The medical examiner tells me he wants to take my sister to do an autopsy. So why would you do that? He said, well, you know, they found this tear, and they have to determine if the tear came as a result of the colonoscopy or not. I said, listen, I said, the surgery went well. The tear was there before the test. I just copied the words that the Rebbe told me. Right. He said, that's not what the hospital told me. So I can't tell you what the hospital says, but you can call the surgeon. This is what the surgeon told my brother-in-law. He calls me back up afterwards, and he says, you're right. We're not going to do an autopsy. The surgery went well. The tear was there before the test. So, the words that the Rebbe told me didn't just give me manuka at the time of a very difficult period, but it also enabled me to stop a further desecration to my sister, even after she was nifter. Um, I was involved in a, in a business, and 
most of my life I've been very successful in business. And as of late, like most people, my mazel really changed. And no matter what I tried, I was not, didn't have the hatzlacha that I used to have. And I'm a person who goes to shul three times a day. I learn every day. I've been going through Dafyomi many times already. And um, I, I put a, a tremendous amount of importance on my hashkaf and where I am in life. So I made an appointment with Rabbi Kimmel, and I had to wait online, and um, it was very convenient because he's in Brooklyn, which made it easier, and the first person I met of importance was Maish, you, and it was incredible how much respect I was treated with, and, and the softness and the kindness, and that gave me the first clue as to what I was going to experience. It was very important that money was not discussed. It was just taking my name and a small history. And um, I went into, I was ushered into Rabbi Kimmel's office, and he asked me to write down my name, and he closed the door. There was tremendous amount, you know, it was a tremendous amount of privacy between the two of us. And he looked at my name, and he started telling me things about my personality. And he was basically on the mark. I mean, it's as if he was looking right into my neshama, and he knew. I've been to other, other Kubalim, but Rabbi Kimmel, although he's very young, I'm older than Rabbi Kimmel, but he, he has the ability to see into people. And what he did do for me was he didn't give me any mumbo-jumbo. What he did for me was he gave me tikkunim that he wanted me to get involved in, such as saying shir shirim before every Shabbos, going to the mikveh at certain times, to be mava sedra, and to do certain things with tefillos, talking about tehillim, about finishing tehillim every week. Everything that he told me to do was resonated because it just magnified my avodas Hashem. He didn't, pro- he didn't promise me anything. All he told me was, do these things to get closer. And we'll see what happens. Um, he also told me that I have a problem with one of my mezuzahs. He said I had a problem with my mezuzah in my bedroom. And he said that the tagim were not good. And I, uh, although I learn all the time, I, and I know what tagging was, I didn't realize the difference between the tagging being high on the right side or the left side, but he, he told me what, what the difference was. One was with Rachman, one was with Din. And he told me that I had to get a new mezuzah for my bedroom, and I should bring in the old one. But what he did was, he took out a very expensive mezuzah, and he just gave it to me. He says, listen, I want you to have the mezuzah. Did he, not only did he give me the mezuzah, but they didn't charge me for it. And he says, bring in the old mezuzah, and we'll see what happens. Well, in the interim, during this whole time, I made a huge investment in a company about six years prior to my meeting with Rabbi Kimmel. And every few months I would call this, this business. It's, a, it's an online company to find out as to where my investments were whether business was good, you know, when you're waiting for something, you, one becomes anxious. I never got a straight answer. About two or three weeks after I changed the mezuzah in my bedroom, I get a call from this dot-com, dot-com company, which I own a piece of, and I said, David, I just want to tell you something. We're just mailing you, we're just giving you some of your investment back and you can expect a check within a few days. But lo and behold, a few days later, I got a check for $47,000. Again, um, I was not promised anything, but it seems that doing all these tikkun at least helped me financially, and um, it made me feel very good that I was doing things that I was supposed to be doing, like saying to him every week, finishing it every week, be my besedra, which I should have been doing anyhow, so that's, that's basically been my history with Rabbi Kimmel. I don't know how to explain it, but I was here with him once, and he, um, he said that he was going to 
he, he, he closed his eyes for a second, and I, I went numb first from the knee down and then from the waist down. And I started laughing. And he, he said, what's the matter? I said, I don't know what happened. I said, but I, I'm, I'm fully numb from the waist down. He said, I put a, a shmira on my, on my nehi, on, on, on that the level of whatever. And, and he says, it's a good thing that I feel it. But he said, the, the sensation will come back shortly. Uh, and it did. Before I left, I, you know, I came back. But like, it, was, uh, it was an experience unlike anything else. Uh, a shmira is a, is a spiritual, spiritual protection, protection for anyone who's doing it. Yeah. Right. So, and you literally felt... I literally the, felt nothing. <laughs> you, you, well, you felt the shmira so taking down. place. Yeah. You actually could feel it. Do you yeah. usually have these type of feelings when he does I things? I didn't before. But I never had that before I met Rabbi Kimmel. And now, more and more it happens. I've gone with him to, to, uh, to the Labamitz Rebbe's oil. And when he was machaving with my shame, I, I felt uh, waves coming off of him. And sometimes if, I, if we're diving in the same minion together, I'll feel a lot of waves coming off of him. Or, and sometimes when he gives me brachas, I feel a tremendous amount from him. So you're literally feeling the energy yeah. and the, the spiritual changes that yeah, he's doing to uh, you. Uh, it's, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing feeling. Uh, yeah, that's what I was going to ask uh, you. Is that a good feeling? Or? A feeling. No, if it wasn't a good feeling, I'd be, I'd be pretty uh, worried about it. But it's, uh, it's a very warm, comforting feeling. I don't know how to, exactly how to explain it. I don't really have the vocabulary for it. But it happens more and more now. 